Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We're excited that you took time out of your busy summer schedule to give us a chance to share what we know about net zero. This is the first part of a four part series on our pathway to net zero. Why is this topic important? Because we need to act now and we need to act together to fight climate change. Now, we've been talking about climate change for 20 or 30 years now. It's not a new topic, but what is new is what we're starting to see. And we're getting a glimpse of what our future could look like if we don't do anything. We're already seeing natural disasters, floods, mass migrations, droughts, heat waves, among other things. And we're starting to see these things on a more frequent basis. Now, we all know Mother Nature can throw us some unusual weather from time to time, but these events are happening more often and more frequently than ever before. There's no doubt that we are, the way that we live is not sustainable, and we are certainly expediting the situation. In fact, it is believed that globally, humans emit 51 billion tons of CO2 every year. Those CO2 emissions hover in our atmosphere, they reflect back down to Earth, causing global warming. This global warming sets a chain reaction of events that will eventually disrupt everything. If we're going to do something, a lot has to change, and we are going to have to look at everything that we do, how we make things, how we power things, how we make our food, how we get around, and of course, how we cool ourselves. And cooling is a hot topic, so to speak, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, globally, we use 17% of our energy on cooling ourselves and our things. That's a lot of energy, and most of that's not clean. And secondly, refrigerants, many systems uh, use synthetic refrigerants, which emit hundreds and even thousands of times more CO2 emissions. Some will tell you that global warming potential is only a potential if it leaks. Well, research shows they leak and they leak a lot. Greenpeace says that 82% of the R22 created its inner atmosphere right now. The scary part is that our, as our Earth warms and our population grows, we're going to have to install more ways of cooling ourselves and our things. I wonder how many people looking, are looking to air conditioners right now in Western Canada. Experts say that the way that if we continue to cool ourselves and our things, the way that we're doing now, it will negate all of the other green initiatives that we're doing. That's why it's important as individuals, municipalities, companies, countries, everyone needs to act now and we need to act together. Now more than ever, every choice and every install matters. The good news is we already have the solutions and the technology to address this. And over the course of the next four weeks, we're going to share what we know to help you and your municipality in our fight against climate change. We are joined today by Bashar Nasser. Bashar started in engineering, moved his way over to management, and now finds himself in a product development role. In his role, he's looking at solutions and technology domestically and globally on how we can expand our use of natural refrigerants that have a net zero global warming potential, how we can reduce and reuse energy better, and how we can incorporate green energy into our designs. Before we pass over Bashar, we have an important quick question to get a feel for the audience. On the right hand of your screen, you're going to see a poll question. How close are you to achieving your net zero goals? Just getting started? Are you halfway there? Or are you very close? The poll will stay up for five minutes and we'll be happy to share the results after. I'm now gonna pass things over to Bashar, but remember that your feedback is welcome and we are with you on reducing your environmental impact. We're here to work with you on your pathway to net zero. Thanks everybody, enjoy the presentation. You're up Bashar. Hey, well, thank you, Dave. And thank you everybody for attending our uh, webinar today. This agenda, today is part one of a four part series. So uh, today's part one, where we'll discuss the climate crisis and carbon neutrality. In parts two and three, we're gonna talk about the roadmap to net zero and the net zero ice rink and present some practical recommendations and, and things that you can implement. And in part four, we're gonna talk about current funding opportunities available to support those initiatives. You can ask questions anytime, I'll turn them into the question box and then we'll address it all at the end. So we'll start talking about the climate emergency. And uh, the question is, what is the climate emergency? The countries are declaring climate emergencies uh, worldwide. Around 2,000 jurisdictions have declared climate emergency, representing 500 municipalities across Canada as well. Canada declared the climate emergency back in 2019. Climate change is widely recognized as the most urgent problem facing humanity. We know that human activity is warming the earth, and we know we have the knowledge, technology, and resources to solve the problem in ways that support the most vulnerable nations and communities. 
On the municipal level, over 500 towns, cities, and communities across Canada have declared a climate emergency. They are realizing this is a real issue and are setting targets and plans to achieve those targets. On the provincial level, provincial governments are also recognizing this is an issue. Every province and territory actually has a climate action plan. I picked four here just to show as examples, but you can easily Google any, any territory or province to look up their specific plan. So on the top left, you can see Ontario's plan, and their ultimate goal is 80% reduction of greenhouse gas 20, by 2050. And there are milestones along the way to help achieve that goal. Below that is Quebec which is even more ambitious. They're aiming for carbon neutrality by 2050, and they have a milestone set for 2030 to reduce emissions by 37.5% below 1990 level. Alberta's plan is in the top right. They have some very specific targets and specific sectors that they want to address. For example, they want to phase out coal generated electricity by 2030. They want to introduce a cap on oil sand emissions, and they want to reduce methane emissions as well. In the bottom right, I've also just picked Nova Scotia as an example. Similar to Quebec, they also want to achieve net zero by 2050. And their interim milestone is to achieve a reduction by 53% below 2005 levels by 2030. You can see that the provincial governments all recognize this is an issue, and they're each implementing different plans to try to target that issue. Finally, going up to the federal level, uh, the, the federal government is committed to become reach net zero by 2050 as well. And just as recently as three months ago, they have set a very aggressive interim target, which is to reduce emissions by 40% by 2030, which is less than a decade away. And the Minister of Environment specifically identified buildings as one area where he believes that megatons can be cut. So we can see all different levels of government are working on this. What is carbon neutrality or being carbon positive? Before we get into that, we need to address some topics like ODP and GWP. ODP refers to ozone depleting potential. The ozone layer naturally exists around the Earth's surface and it protects it from harmful UV rays from the sun. Those UV rays, if they get through, can cause really uh, harmful health, uh, health problems such as skin cancer. So harmful chemicals such as PFCs, which were used for refrigerant, were breaking down this ozone layer and allowing these UV rays to enter. This issue was discovered back in the 60s, and that was the, by finding the ozone uh, layer hole that was over the South Pole. Now you can see pictures of the South Pole over time, and you can see that the hotspot was there in the 70s, and that it was slowly improving, and the last picture in 2018 was almost completely gone and the overall temperature is a cooler blue returning to normal. So you can see by putting a plan in place and, and getting rid of those PFCs, we are actually allowed the ozone layer to regenerate and heal itself. Following that, the next problem that was discovered was the global warming effect, which is caused by greenhouse gases. The abbreviation for that is GHG, and global warming potential is a measure, and the abbreviation for that is GWP. So the greenhouse effect is naturally occurring effect. There are gases in the atmosphere like carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, or methane, which act as a kind of blanket. When the earth, sun's heat gets into the earth, some of that heat stays inside the earth. And this is crucial to maintaining water in a liquid state, which is vital to life, and maintaining all of our ecosystems in balance. Now, due to human intervention, we have released and created more of those gases than, than there is normal naturally in the atmosphere. And now more of the heat is getting trapped, which is causing the Earth's temperature to slowly rise year after year. When you look on the right, you can see the breakdown of the common greenhouse gases. The majority, about 75% in total, is carbon dioxide, followed by methane and nitrous oxide. Now, because carbon dioxide is the most common, it's used as the base unit measure of GWP. So the GWP of carbon dioxide or CO2 is a measure of one. And all other gases are measured relative to that baseline. So if you look up a gas and it says that the GWP is 1000, it means that that gas when released to the atmosphere is a thousand times more harmful 
in terms of its global warming effect than CO2. And how do we know that this uh, climate change is impacted by humans? Well, this really interesting graph shows the carbon dioxide levels in parts per million in the atmosphere on the left-hand side. And on the bottom, it shows the number of years looking back. And it goes back 800,000 years. And you can see the levels are, on average, are fairly consistent with some natural spikes that occurred likely due to natural events like volcanic eruption. And when those events happen, then the carbon dioxide is absorbed. As we know, the trees absorb it, convert, convert it back to oxygen, and the level stays fairly steady. Now you can see on the far right around 1950, um, as the Industrial Revolution was really ramping up, which started in the early 1900s, the levels spiked and then continued to really spike uh, beyond any point uh, that was normal before. And if you're wondering how uh, the scientists were able to figure this out, because I was thinking that too, I couldn't picture a caveman scientist 800,000 years ago taking air quality samples. The way they actually figured it out was by coring ice samples. And they can date the ice and they can extract the CO2 level and then extrapolate what had been in the atmosphere at that time. So that's how they were able to look that far back at the data. Next, we like to look at the energy flow. So the energy is created from different sources, but it's used in different locations in our economy and our society. So on the left-hand side, you can see the sources of energy, which could be from wind, or solar, or natural gas, or coal. And on the right, you can see where they're being used. And besides the transportation sector, really the majority of the areas are in buildings, whether they're residential, commercial, or industrial buildings. In terms of energy production, uh, we can see for Canada where the energy is coming from. More than 50% is coming from hydro, followed by 15% for uranium. And then after that is natural gas and coal, and then some other renewable sources like solar and wind. Now, if you're interested as well, you can find this for any province, and it can really vary from province to province as to how the energy is being generated. In terms of the energy sources, we can break them into two categories renewable and non-renewable. Renewable sources are, as the name implies, they will not run out and they're not sources of CO2 or, or greenhouse gases. Those would be solar, wind, hydro, and biogas. On the right, there are the non-renewable sources, which are generally sources of CO2, and that would be natural gas, coal, and oil. So as we strive to become, to reach these net zero targets that we talked about earlier, we have to transfer from non-renewable to renewable. There's many efforts to do this underway, but of course this is a huge undertaking, which will take many decades to reach. So if we're trying to hit carbon neutrality targets by 2050, we have to also look at reducing our energy use. If we can reduce our energy use, that will take a load off of our energy production sources and make it easier to provide that energy from new renewable sources. In terms of municipal facilities, we can look at a breakdown uh, that we can see of where the different buildings are generating and consuming gas and electricity. On the left is natural gas, and you can see arena specifically around 17%, which is quite high when you think about that that's usually, in many communities, there's only one building uh, that's an arena compared to the other buildings that comprise that. And for electricity, it's also relatively high at 12%. We can also look at multi-purpose buildings because those consume a lot of natural gas and electricity as well. And a lot of modern facilities these days are a combination where they would have an arena and their multi-purpose facility like that includes a community center or a library or sometimes even a school attached to it. So when we're looking at opportunities for efficiencies, uh, oftentimes we need to look at a holistic view of those buildings. So carbon neutrality. So in general, for society, achieving net zero emissions means our economy either emits no greenhouse gas emissions or offsets its emissions, for example, through actions such as tree planting or employing technologies that can capture carbon before it's released into the air. So typically, when we think of emissions, these are the things we think about, uh, smoke, the stacks, or, or power fumes. We don't typically think of a building, specifically not a community ring. 
what does it mean for building? The Canada Green Building Council sets the standard for zero carbon buildings in Canada. A zero carbon building is a highly energy efficient building that produces on site or procures carbon free renewable energy or high quality carbon offsets in an amount sufficient to offset the annual carbon emissions associated with building materials and operations. So when they're looking at it, they're actually looking at the, at the entire life cycle of the building from construction to operation to the, the demolition. And they look at three components when they're looking at this calculation. They look at the embodied carbon, the operational carbon, and the avoided emission. So it's all about a very careful balance in order to be able to achieve this. We'll get into each of these three components in a little bit more detail. The embodied carbon, as the name kind of suggests, has to do with the body of the building. That starts with upfront carbon, which is in the construction, which is raw material, transportation, and the construction process. Next is the used stage carbon during the operation. Again, that's the material used in construction for any maintenance, repairs, or refurbishment. Following that is the end of life, which is a demolition, which includes the demolition process, waste removal, and disposal. Really, the best time to affect the embodied carbon and to reduce it is, is early on in the design of a new building. Because that's, once that's set, it's very difficult to be able to positively impact this over the life of the building. And life of, on the life of a building could be up to 50 years. So it's really important to take that careful planning up front in order to, to achieve net zero for that particular building. Next is the operational carbon. That consists of direct emission, which could be from natural gas combustion and fugitive emissions, which are basically leaks from refrigerants, and indirect emission, which are from district heating and cooling systems and purchased electricity. The third category is the avoided carbon emission. And that comes from renewable energy, which is on site generated and has to exceed the building demand and transmitted or sold back to the grid. And lastly, there's carbon offset. These are our last report, and that's basically a credit for carbon reduction that is occurring somewhere else and purchased to compensate for the building emission. So here are three different scenarios when we're doing that calculation. On the left-hand side, we have a carbon positive building, which is traditional buildings, like most of the ones we have today. The embodied carbon, operational carbon, outweighs the avoided carbon. Net zero carbon building is where we're trying to basically get to, it was where we're going. And that's where the embodied carbon operational is just right in balance with the avoided emission. And even better to get to in the future would be carbon negative, in which the avoided emissions exceed the embodied carbon and operational carbon. And in that case, that could be a building that even is the one who's selling those credits to other buildings instead of having to purchase credits itself. So we're looking in detail at a typical ring. Where do the greenhouse gas emissions come from? Well, one area where they come from is synthetic refrigerants, if that's what the ring is using. And that could be up to 200 metric tons per year. A second area is combustion from natural gas, which could be for water heating or space heating. And that could be up to 65 tons of CO2. And the third area is from electric power generation if that power is coming from a non-renewable resource, for example, from a coal-fired plant, then those emissions count against the building, and that could be up to 400 tons. So when you add those up, you get to 665 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. So we're going to do a quick poll now, which will come up on the right-hand side. And just to try to quantify, what does that really mean? 665 metric tons of CO2 per year. So we're gonna to try to give some real life examples and guess which one is equivalent to that amount. Is it 145 passenger vehicles driven for one year? A year's worth of energy used in 80 homes? 75,000 gallons of gasoline? or all of the above. We'll just give a 
few seconds for everybody to put their answer in. So the answer is D, all of the above. So either of those when tabulated in that fashion is equivalent to 665 metric tons of CO2 per year, which are emitted at an average rate. Most people got that right, which is great. Next, we're gonna talk in a little bit more detail about refrigerants and how they relate to emission. Because as we just saw, for the zero carbon building, refrigerant leaks are a main source of direct emission. So we need to understand how that works. We're gonna go back in time a little bit, seven years ago to 2014. At the time, this was the phase out update for refrigerant. You can see the first three refrigerants, which are in red, are CFC. And in the ODP column, you can see they have an ozone depleting potential value, which is fairly high. They also have a fairly high GWP value in the following column. Those were no longer produced at that time and they were phased out in the 90s. Now at the time, the next category was HDFCs, which were invented after CFC, and, and mainly R22 was the popular one. You can see it still had an ODP value, even though it's 0 0.05, it, it's low, but it's still causing harm to the ozone layer. And the GW value is 1700, which is still, which is still high. That was undergoing a phase out and the completion of that phase out was happening in 2020. Next category, we had HFCs, which were invented as, after HDFs. And those next four, you can see they have zero for ODP. So those don't impact the ozone layer, but they still have very high GWP value from 1300 up to 3,900. Below that, you can see two natural refrigerants, which are carbon dioxide and ammonia. Carbon dioxide has zero ODP and GWP of only one. Ammonia has zero ODP and also zero GWP. So again, if you recall, the GWP measure is relative to carbon dioxide or CO2. So when you're looking at that list, you can see that R507 refrigerant is 3,900 times more harmful than CO2 when compared like that. So at this time, you can see there was no plans to phase out HFC. So if you were a, a, a rank owner and you were installing a new system, you could have installed an R404 and R507 system at the time and, and felt sort of comfortable doing that. Suddenly, two years later, environmental regulations moved to target the high GWP refrigerant. That specifically was R507 and R404. And those had the really high GWP values. So now somebody who installed the system after only two years, they're being told that the refrigerant is unacceptable to use and is now undergoing a phase down. So that's a very quick development at that time. Then four years later, as more awareness is being drawn to all these issues from an environmental perspective, more regulations are coming out. The California Air Resource Board is now declaring any refrigerant with a GWP of only 150 or higher to be considered high global warming. And they even go into detail to list those refrigerants and they give the global warming potential value. So you can see the four on the bottom are around 600. Now these are what's called refrigerant blends. So a blend is a mix of one or two more uh, refrigerants. So as you can see, for example, R513, is a mix of R134, which was an HFC, like we saw on the previous slide, and R1234YF, which is now the newly invented synthetic refrigerant called HFO. So by mixing those together, the makers of the refrigerants are attempting to bring down and lower the GWP value. However, as we see in California, they're clearly still identifying these and labeling them as the, having a high global warming potential. Now, the interesting thing about the GWP values we've been talking about is they're, is they're called 100 year rating. So it's calculating the negative impact over 100 years after a release of the gas. Uh, the Canada Green Building Council actually advocates to measure over what's called a 20 year rating. 
a 20 year rating is less flattering and actually shows that these are much more harmful in the short term. So for example, our 513 over 20 year rating would become 3000 GWP, not 100. The other reason why they're pushing for this is if you recall all the plans we saw earlier are pushing for being carbon neutral by 20, 2050. So the timelines we're talking about are 30 year timelines. So they're arguing that we should use measurements that reflect those timelines so that we can actually hit those goals. We shouldn't be talking a measurement that refers to something that it's gonna be in a hundred years. Now we move on to the phase out update as of 2020 and ice rinks specifically fall under the chillers category. So you can see as of January 1st, 2025, there'll be a limitation and any new system involved installed for a rink can't use a refrigerant to the GWP higher of 700. So that's becoming the threshold that's gonna be set in Canada. Now these phase downs were implemented through various international agreements that were signed over the years, which Canada has signed on to, as well as many other countries, which are listed here at the bottom. Most recently, one of those is the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. And as of 2021, they published the schedule for phase down of these HFCs. As you can see, there's targets that change about every four years. And by 2036, they're looking at a reduction back to 15% of baseline values of terms of production and consumption of the HFC. So that's a very aggressive when you think that's only 15 years away. And the baseline values they refer to are actually mean values that were measured between 2011 and 2013 is how those were calculated. When we look more at the history of refrigerant, we can actually see that artificial refrigeration was first invented way back in the 1830s. At the time, natural refrigerants like ammonia and CO2 were actually the first ones used for a long time. In the 1900s, the new synthetic refrigerants were invented. And then after many decades of use, it was realized with the harmful impact of the ozone layer, and those were phased out. After that, in the 1990s, HCFCs were being used. Now, those had also a small ozone depleting potential, but they also had a high global warming potential. And then those were phased out. Following that, the HFCs were invented as the next best thing. And those did not have an ozone depleting potential, but they're really harmful for global warming. And those are undergoing the phase down, which we have just spoken about. And the most recent development was the HFOs, which as mentioned earlier, are part of these newer plants. Now we're still in the early days of discovering those, uh, but some of the negative environmental impacts are already being discovered and are quite concerning. So when we're talking in 2030, what's gonna be the thresholds for phase outs or phase downs or what's gonna be allowed or not be allowed to be used? Is the threshold gonna be 1500, 750 or as low as 150? And are there other concerns besides just the GWP values that we have to look at? A new concern that became apparent with these HF4 refrigerants, as discovered by a study published earlier this year, is triaflora acetic acid, known as TFA, which are basically acid rain. It's been discovered that these are getting into the atmosphere and they're bonding with the moisture in the atmosphere, getting into our water cycle, and then ending up in our freshwater resources, soil, and the ocean. These are what's known as a forever chemical. They're identified as a toxin. They're not healthy for aquatic organisms. And the study even found potential harmful, side, harmful effects to the liver and thyroid function. And the thing that's scary about those as well is they cannot be removed from drinking water with the current purification process that we use in our water treatment plant. Further environmental impact, Another study recently found that the HFO1234ZE might be actually breaking down into HFC23 into the atmosphere. And that has a GWP of 14,800, which is extremely high as we saw when we were looking at our rest of refrigerant GWP value. A second consideration is indirect impact. 
That's emissions resulting from manufacturing of refrigerant. All these refrigerants have to be manufactured through, through a process for, for their uses. So the GWP we've been talking about is the direct impact of that refrigerant is released to the atmosphere. On the graph on the right, that's represented by the orange bar. But another consideration is the emissions resulting from manufacturing those refrigerants in the first place. That's represented by the blue graphs on the left. So you could see for ammonia, it's 2.1 and zero, which is fairly low. For R744, which is actually CO2 carbon dioxide, it's also very low. The manufacturing emission is 0.8 and the GWP, as we said, is one. If you go further to the right and look at the synthetic refrigerants, you can see on the far right, the R134A, which is an HFC, had a relatively high manufacturing emission number and also a very high GWP of 1360. And the one beside it, which is 1234YF, is that new HFO that's developed. So you could see when they synthesized this new refrigerant, they were able to get a GWP of the refrigerant to be fairly low. But the process is extremely energy intensive and produces lots of harmful emission. emission. And you can see that by the, by the big blue bar there. And as mentioned before, the blends are basically combining those two refrigerants. So they're gonna be sort of trying to average out those harmful effects as they blend together. The other issue that these phase downs uh, and phase outs the refrigerant create is increasing the cost of the refrigerant. This, this graph shows the cost of refrigerants over the last 20 years. The blue dots represent the cost of synthetic refrigerant. Now, you could see that the cost of those are always rising. The reason for that is as owners buy those systems, they're stuck with them. And when the refrigerant is phased out, the supply becomes limited, but the demand stays high. And as we know, when there is a high demand local supply, the price of anything will naturally go up. And those owners are stuck bearing the cost. You can see on the bottom green dots represent the price of natural refrigerants over time. And it's extremely low. And a couple of reasons for that is one, that those have not experienced any phase outs or phase downs. So there has been no issue in that regard. And the second thing is that they're not proprietary or patented chemical formulas uh, that anybody you know, gains a profit from uh, because they're naturally occurring. The cost is always uh, very easy to manage for owners. So why blaze a trail to net zero? Well, first and foremost is a quality of life. We all owe social responsibility to each other and to our planet and to future generations to ensure sustainability and healthy environment. There's the outside influences, which we discussed, we see there's gonna be political pressures and government mandates. There's a business case to be made to blaze the trail to net zero. Uh, by installing energy reduction, the owners will actually also save money. There's incentive programs that are also going to be currently coming out to support these initiatives, which will be discussed in more detail in part four of this webinar series. And uh, from a business standpoint, uh, GAG reductions can even be marketed to customers as they value uh, businesses that have a strong environment. Stand. There's also a business risk in terms of doing nothing or in terms of trying not to avoid blazing a shelter net zero. That is, you have to pull the refrigerant phase out, the downward trend of DWP levels, and these rising costs of the interim refrigerants like we saw. So when it comes to an arena or an ice rink, what is an F-zero ice rink? We believe an F-zero ice rink has three main components. First is eliminating refrigerant emissions. And that's what we just discussed here. Then it has to be net zero global warming potential of refrigerant, zero ozone depleting potential of refrigerant. And the refrigerant should be really free of those PFAs, those harmful acids. The second area to focus on is optimizing energy consumption. That's looking at strategies like heat recovery, energy monitoring, and energy efficient product and design. And that will be discussed in more detail in part two of our webinar series. And the third component, which is if you recall the net zero carbon standard is those avoided emissions, which you need on the other side of the scale, is harnessing green power. 
and that could be sustainable energy sources, whether they're on-site or being procured from off-site. So the path to net zero, how do we get there? Well, to find out more, please tune in to our next three parts of the webinar series. And in the upcoming two parts, we'll discuss strategies and, and practical means that you can implement to your facility, whether it's an existing facility or design considerations, if you're considering building a new facility. And after that, in part four, we'll get into detail about some current grants that are available and how you can access those grants to support these initiatives. Thank you for joining today. I will address any questions now in the chat box and you can also feel free to reach me anytime. This is my email address. If you think of something following the webinar. Thank you very much. Okay, th th thanks very much, Bashar. And uh, you know what, that was a great presentation. And uh, you know, the interesting thing, our first polling question, we have over 200 municipalities here and uh, the 74% uh, of those municipalities are just getting started, or sorry, 76% are just getting started on their pathway towards net zero. So that was a very, uh, great inf information in regards to uh, the overview of net zero. Um, the subsequent uh, videos coming or the, the hour sessions will get into some more depth on actually how to get there. Is that correct? That's correct, yep. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna take a look here to see if we have any questions for you. We've got a, a couple of minutes left here. So uh, we do have one question here. Um, so the question is, uh, you refer to CO2 as being bad, but then you said CO2 is good for the environment. Uh, CO2 refrigerant is good for the environment. Can you please clarify that? Yeah, for sure. So um, CO2 that's, that's generally bad is resulting from emissions from uh, power generation or from transportation, uh, like cars and things like that. When we look at CO2 strictly as a refrigerant, one area to consider is that the GWP was one, which was very low uh, when you compare it to some of the other blends available right now, which are 600. Um, so it's those are 600 times more harmful than CO2. And the other thing to consider is when it's used as a refrigerant, it's actually from reclaimed CO2 from the atmosphere. So uh, when there is a, there is a, a, a small leak, there is no net gain of, of CO2 as a result of using that uh, as a refrigerant. And in addition to those, it's actually also an extremely efficient refrigerant as well. Okay, so um, here's another question here. It's in regards to another refrigerant question, Bashar. It's uh, Ammonia uh, is may have zero GWP, but it's toxic and dangerous. Why would I want to put that in my system? Yeah, for sure. So ammonia has been used for uh, over easily over 100 years, as we saw in the history of refrigerants there, and it's used in many large facilities and many many huge industrial applications besides just ice rink, uh, like cold storage warehouses and things like that. And the codes and regulations are uh, very good in terms of uh, safeguarding it and using it. Um, the, any refrigerant really is dangerous when it's released and in a closed space. Uh, there has been just as many incidents uh, occurring, uh, safety incidents, uh, fatalities occurring from synthetic refrigerants as there have been from, from using ammonia in the past as well. So you have to be careful with any refrigerant, regardless of what it is, and have the proper safety guards follow the codes and standards best practices and install uh, the life safety devices in place like leak detection, ventilation, and alarms and things like that. Okay, um, another question here, Bashar. Um, I have an existing building. Um, can I actually get to net zero? Uh, that's a very good question for sure. Uh, because as we saw that embodied carbon is hard to control once the building is built. So maybe it depends on the existing building. I believe the best course would be to do an assessment because each building is different and assess uh, how it's currently constructed, what the current uh, emissions are to do that calculation. Like the one I showed, which was a simplified version that could be modeled for each and every specific building. And then from there, a plan can be set towards achieving net zero. And it uh, will be challenging for an existing building and maybe things like carbon credits have to be used at the end, uh, ultimately to actually uh, become fully neutral at that point. Okay, 
And um, okay, so I got one final question here, Bashar. Uh, the final question is, like, is are the regulations different depending on the industry? Uh, no, like regulations aren't different as, as we saw. This only depends on the type of system and the GWP of refrigerant is being used as the primary driver in setting uh, the regulation. So it doesn't make a difference if the system is installed uh, in an ice rink or in a grocery store supermarket. That doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Okay. Um, all right. I got another question here. Um, so, given the embodied carbon life considerations, what is the best option for the next 30 years with respect to the types of renewable energy and the types of refrigerant to use? Uh, in terms of reducing that for the next 30 years, uh, really you have to be able to use a natural refrigerant uh, because you want to avoid those direct emissions, as we saw, which can occur from, from the leaks. And and another thing to really focus on is using heat recovery as much as possible. A uh, refrigeration system is naturally rejecting the heat to make ice and dumping it outside. And then you're installing boilers, you know, to to and burning natural gas. So a really huge step to take towards to getting that within 30 years is to have 100 percent waste heat recovery and utilizing that uh, for heating the building instead of utilizing gas. Okay. Um is uh is Simcoe prepared to uh, assist our municipality in uh, putting together a net zero plan regarding the refrigeration and ice rink? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a strong team in place and we have uh, professional engineers on staff. And uh, we're, we're experienced having worked on installed over 6,000 ice rinks. Uh, we, we offer different options available and we've been installing systems like uh, with um, heat recovery, like our eco chill system for over 20 years now. So I believe we're very well positioned to be able to support a municipality to put together that plan for their ice rink. Yeah, that, that's that's good. Uh, so that's, unless anybody else has any other questions, um, we'll wrap things up. I guess, you know, Bashar, seeing your presentation um, and seeing what's happening out there, it's pretty easy to feel discouraged, I think, or scared about global warming. But I think, you know, if COVID taught us anything uh, was that when we come together, we can solve these problems. And I think that we still have time to solve this uh, to reduce our impact. And uh, and really, this is a very important initiative uh, that we're going through right now. So thank you very much for sharing your knowledge today. And I would encourage anybody to reach out to Bashar uh, to uh, engage with him if you have any more questions or want to continue this dialogue or discussion. I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Um, Oh, there's one last question here, Bashar, that just came in. Um, to switch to a natural refrigerant, do you need to upgrade the whole system? That's a, a question that just came in. Uh, yes, typically you would have to. I'm assuming that the person who's asking the question has a synthetic refrigerant in place right now. Um, so that would be a, a pretty a big upgrade to, to replace the system. But again, as we work with our customers, what we typically do is work on a life cycle plan of their system, which involves identifying all the equipment age and planning when replacement will be. So that could be working towards to a net zero over time. So if their system is currently uh, you know, 15 years old and the life cycle of it is 20 years, then we can work on a plan that in five years they can start planning and arranging the funding and accessing grants to do that replacement such that when that system is already aged and needs to be replaced, Take, take advantage of that and switch to the natural refrigerant at that point. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bashar. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, catching up with you again next week when we meet up with Benoit on really digging into the how we can uh, start to put some of these things in place. So enjoy the rest of your day, everybody, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. See you later. Goodbye, thank you.